So I was really glad that uh, Pear gave me so much time uh, to present to you guys today, but if we want to talk about API security, it's actually a really short talk, right? API security is solved by API keys. Done. Can I get an applause? Next speaker. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously though, how many times do you hear this? Like, okay, we're gonna have APIs, we need to secure it, we're gonna use API keys. And then you move on. What are API keys though? API keys are revocable, non-expiring, bare access tokens. At this show, I would expect people to like understand what that means. Most of the places like people don't, but if you don't, what is that? It's a symmetric key. Yeah, well, what's that? It's a password, it's a password. So if, if, if we think about in, our, I, in other scenarios, like browsers and, and all of the problems that we're having with passwords, uh, now hopefully most people have a password manager, like in the last talks, like how many people of you know what your passwords are? Like one person said, I don't even know because I'm using a password manager, right? You sort of starting to solve this problem uh, of passwords by making it simpler to manage them, but now we're gonna start with APIs and mobile access kind of where we left off with this broken security system, we need to not be just using API keys or maybe not even using them at all. So what should we do? How should we solve this problem? Any, any suggestions? I bet you someone in here is thinking OAuth, right? We'll just, okay, OAuth and it's solved. Just open the box and now OAuth and, and we have the solution. Well, uh, I wish it was that simple. I wish I could just tell you use OAuth and all of your API security problems are, are solved. But in the same way that you can't just use API keys and the problem goes away, you also can't just use OAuth and the problem goes away. So let's unpack that box, let's look at OAuth, uh, and let's see how we actually can begin securing access to our data through APIs. Any, any questions like what is an API? I hope I don't have to answer that, but it's, it's a contract. It's a way of asking someone uh, how to get data and it's usually over a network, um, HTTP. But in order to actually create secure access to your data, sure, API security is part of that, but it's not the only part. We have to have a holistic approach to this that includes enterprise security, like you know, checking some identities, giving out some employee badges, checking your customers, uh, having them sign different forms, things like that, so you really uh, know who people are who are, are coming into your offices, things like that. Uh, intrusion detection on your servers, whatnot. Mobile security, more generally endpoint security, virus scanning, all that sort of stuff. Um, MDM, those sort of things. And then API security is of course part of that. But we need to have this, this holistic approach if we're gonna actually create a secure system, a secure organization for accessing data. And if we look at that in general, those three big spheres or concerns, identity is at the middle of this. So knowing who somebody is, is sort of first and foremost. Until you know who I am, you can't decide, shall I invite you to into my house, right? It starts with authentication, then it becomes authorization. Who you are, then what you're allowed to do. And the lack of identity standards, or the lack of uh, being able to encode that in a digital form with restful APIs, or with uh, modern ways of creating APIs, has been a real barrier for a lot of organizations trying to adopt this new way of, of providing access to data. But now we have great standards, great standards that are created by international standards bodies that are peer reviewed, that are tested, that are um, open to implement. Uh, we have many, many choices uh, from both open source and closed source vendors. So we have lots of choices now for securing our access to RESTful web services. And I would say even better than in, in, in previous paradigms where we were building with WS Star and, and uh, Soapful web services. And this stack begins, first of all, with delegated access, with OAuth 2. And then on top of that, we're gonna build for federation, and I'll get into what these are, uh, if these terms aren't familiar to you. But here we're using a standard called OpenID Connect. And to actually represent who somebody is, we have the JSON identity suite that encodes tokens and keys and algorithms and all sorts of things like that in JSON data structures, which is really good because we have a 
that low technology barrier. There's pretty much a JSON encoder in, in, in every language. So it's not like XML that's very hard with its namespaces. So now all of these things are encoded in the simple data structure. And then as far as creating users, adding users, um, managing groups, things like this can be done through a RESTful API that's standardized by the IETF called SKIM, or System for Cross-Domain Identity Management. And we can even do authentication uh, using mobile devices, using public key encryption, using UTF. And then across all of that, we want to authorize this access. That's the real fundamental thing that we're trying to do, is to figure out, should you be allowed to access my systems or not? And we can use something called Alpha, which is a, a sort of JSON-like domain-specific language for defining policies. So we don't write if this, then that in our code. We can have a policy that we are enforcing uh, within our, our APIs and our services. I don't have time to go into all of the layers in that stack, but I do want to unpack at least the first two, uh, OAuth and OpenID Connect. So OAuth 2 is sort of a meta protocol. It's a framework. Um, it's a, a standard on which you can build other standards. So it's, it's very loose. It's, it has a lot of different things inside of it. And the reason is so that it can be that basis or substrate on which we build those other standards, those other uh, ways of doing different related things. And some of those standards are OpenID Connect, which I'll talk about, but others like UMA, NAPS, uh, TV Everywhere, uh, and others. And OAuth 2 is really designed to address some very important and fundamental requirements that systems have, particularly around delegated access, which I'll talk a lot about. Also around reduced or no password sharing. So you're not giving out your password anymore to different web applications, but instead you are, at that the application is able to use OAuth to ensure that you've logged in, ensure that you've authorized it to do certain things, but without making the, your password available to it. So reducing that password sharing problem, which also subsequently makes it easier to revoke access to specific applications. To accomplish this, there are four actors in OAuth. We have the resource owner, as the specification calls it, which is end user. Then we have the client, another word from the spec, which means like the mobile app or the web app. And then we have the authorization server, which is more generally is a security token service. And in sort of day-to-day -day talk, you'll just call it the OAuth server. And then you have the resource server, which is the API. So these are the four actors within the uh, OAuth dance that you'll see. And the way that dance is played out is, first of all, you'll have some end user that will authorize an application or uh, say that this application should be able to do things on my behalf, should be able to access my data. In order for that to happen, the OAuth server needs to know, well, who, who is at the other end here? So the end user will authenticate some, some way. And then depending, the, the user will be shown some sort of screen or dialogue saying, do you want to authorize this mobile application, this web application, to do things on your behalf? These are the things that it's going to do, yes or no. Sometimes you may do login differently. Uh, sometimes you may have authorized this application when you signed your employment contract, when you accepted the end user license agreement of the software. Uh, so this, this can vary to the end user. But behind the scenes, what's happening is that that client, that mobile application, that web application is making a request to the OAuth server. The OAuth server is showing that uh, login screen. The user authenticates themselves, and a one-time usage code or a nonce, no more than once token, is sent back to the client. And then the client sends that up to the OAuth server, this time with its own credential. So now the client is known as well as the end user. That's the then returning what's called an access token, and I'll get into that. That access token is used to call the API. Depending on the type of access token, that access token might need to be verified with the OAuth server. And then if it's valid and trusted, it the data will be returned to the client. So this is one flow in OAuth. There are four, and like I said, it's a framework, so you can define others uh, in addition to those. And, and some of those standards, like OpenID Connect, do define other flows. So this, this flow is sort of like three-legged OAuth, if you've ever heard that term kicked around, uh, but it's called the web server flow or the co code flow. OAuth defines something called scopes. Think of scopes like permissions or rights that you are 
delegating or authorizing some third party to do on your behalf. They are often presented to the user in some sort of consent screen, hopefully not ever as egregious as this, uh, but this at least gives you an idea of how that could manifest itself or look. There are no uh, standard scopes in OAuth. It just says it's a space separated list. So you can do anything you want with those scopes. You can create very simple things or you can create very complex things. There are different kinds of tokens. There are access tokens and refresh tokens. Think of an access token like a session and think of a refresh token like a password. This is a very powerful token. Access tokens less powerful. W to imagine what I mean by comparing those two to a session and a password, think about if you go to like a, a bank or a website where you log in. For a little while, you're not gonna have to log in again. So that you use that password to create the session. In the same way, when you go to the OAuth server, you can get an access token and start making API calls, but eventually this is going to expire. You can use a refresh token to get a new access token. Just like when you went to the website and logged in with your password, you got a new session. Does that make sense? There are different profiles of tokens. Primarily what you're going to deal with is bearer tokens, but there's also another, and that's holder of key tokens. If you're working in government or banking, you need to understand what this is. You need to understand the consequences of using this sort. Um, to help you think of, of a bearer token like cash. If you find a 100 kroner note, 100 kroner uh, bill on the street after the conference, good for you. <laughs> and then if you took that into the shop and tried to buy something with it, the, the clerk, the person at the store is not going to ask you, where did you get this? They're just going to take it and and let you buy your things with it. And the reason is because they trust the issuer, the government of Sweden, that it's a, a, a legitimate 100 kroner note. And so that you can use it. Doesn't matter that you found it on the street. That's the bearer token. If you find a token, good for you. You can use it. On the other hand, holder of key is like a credit card. If you find my credit card and then you take that into the shop, hopefully the clerk is gonna ask you, can, do you have some identification? Can you prove that you're Travis Spencer? And when you can't, hopefully they'll, they'll deny you access to uh, buying those goods with that credit card. In the same way, if you find a holder of key token, you won't be able to present that to the API. So this is about binding the presenter of the token to the one for who it was issued, binding the credit card to the one to whom it was issued. There are also different types of tokens, lots and lots of types. Um, originally, this was thought to be a deficiency of the OAuth 2 specification because it would hinder interoperability, but in fact it helps it because now you can have all sorts of types of tokens issued by your OAuth server to work with existing systems and to switch between the types. And I'll, I'll show you a very popular use case uh, for switching the different types. Um, you could have WS security, SAML tokens, you can even have customs, and actually this is the most common kind of a uh, uh, type of token. And you can also have JOT tokens. A JOT token is like the English word JOT, like to write something quickly. It's meant to be very small, very compact, to fit into HTTP headers, to fit into query string arguments. Every single bit and byte that's not needed in there is thrown out, including like padding on encoding and things like this. It's, it's meant to be used in, in mobile scenarios, which means it's less expressive than other sorts of tokens. It doesn't have every single feature this is also a good thing because most of those features you're probably not going to need. And of course, it's encoded with SAML instead of XML. There's also different ways of passing tokens. We can pass tokens by value and we can pass them by reference. So the programmers in the room, I, I bet you probably got it already, but in case you didn't, what I mean by that is when you pass a, a token by value, all of the identity data is in the token. If you pass a token by reference, it's just some random string and it points to the actual data, the actual identity information about that token. Does that make sense? I'm gonna get back to that in a little bit. So, so remember I said OAuth, API security solved, right? Not really. And the reason is because OAuth is not for authentication. It, it's, it's not a full solution, it's not a panacea. It's also not for federation and it's not for authorization. OAuth, auth, it's not for authentication or authorization. What's the auth part? Uh, it's, it's a misnomer. It should be called something else. 
it's really for delegation, and in particular, user-to-app delegation. So this is a lot of semantics, uh, but what I mean here is like, OAuth is about allowing someone else to do something on your behalf. It's not about authorizing you to do something. It's not saying that you, you will now be able to do something just because I say you should be able to. To understand that, think about if you're a business owner. You hire an assistant to help you manage the, the finances of the company. And you say to that assistant, like, okay, you can withdraw money out of, out of the, the company bank account. I, I am delegating that right, that scope, that permission to the assistant. Then the assistant walks down to the bank and tries to take money out of the corporate account. But the banker says, I'm sorry, you can't do that. It's the banker who makes the authorization decision. The banker says, you haven't signed the right forms, you haven't gone through the right procedure, access denied. So it, it's a semantics, but it's an important one. Just because you are delegating rights doesn't mean that you are going to be able to call that API. The API makes the decision. Make sense? Okay, so we can build on top of uh, OAuth and we can build all sorts of different things. There, in the specification, there's many sort of you should do this and you, you may do this, but then there are these other standards who turn those shoulds and mays into requires. Uh, and that means like, okay, to conform to these other specifications, you're gonna have to do things that you wouldn't have to in the base OAuth specification. And OpenID Connect does that. Uh, and the reason it's doing that is it's adding uh, an identity layer on top of OAuth. So what I mean by adding an identity layer is OAuth is not for authentication. And you see it around uh, the web being used for that reason. And um, you, you end up reading about some very big organizations being hacked, such as Facebook. And the reason is because there, there isn't enough information in those protocol messages to f actually know who it was that authenticated and identified themselves. So organizations will add on top of OAuth extra information into the protocols. And I mean, the, pro the point of having a protocol is to have a standard, but once you start to add all these other things into there, you end up with this um, uh, incompatibility defeating the point of the standard. So OpenID Connect came along and said, okay, rather than all these 50 plus ways of doing this, we'll have a, a standard for that, for adding authentication and identity on top of OAuth. And this is, anybody heard of OpenID? OpenID 2 is not the same as OpenID Connect. So you often hear about OpenID in the context of like commenting on blogs and things like that. OpenID Connect, is more like SAML 2, actually, in that it has all of that same rigor, all that same security properties that something like SAML 2 or WS Federation has. And by being built on top of OAuth 2, you get, you get a two for one. You deploy OpenID, and you get all that authentication, all that identity stuff, plus now you get API security by, pr by using OAuth 2. Built for mobile, not backward compatible with OpenID Connect, or OpenID 2, but probably not a big deal for most. It's two pretty ex uh, important innovations are the advent of something called the user info endpoint, which I'll talk about, and an ID token. So we already had all this stuff about tokens, right? I just talked for a few minutes about token this and token that. Well, OpenID Connect gives you one more, and that's an ID token. And that ID token is meant for the client, the mobile application or the web application, whereas those others that I talked about are for the API for the OAuth server. And I'll show you how that works. So first of all, you have some sort of uh, relying party or client. We, we have a new spec, so we need new names. I'm sorry for that. A relying party is the same thing as an OAuth client. And that uh, relying party will send over a request to the OAuth server, which in OpenID Connect terminology uh, is called an OpenID provider. Um, but in this request, unlike the normal OAuth flow, it will send a scope that's defined by the standard called OpenID. And this clicks the OAuth server into OpenID Connect mode. So now the, the OAuth server uh, will authenticate the client like normal, however it wants to do that. The specification doesn't say, it just says it has to be done. And then the, the one-time usage code will come back uh, like normal. And then that code will be sent over to the OAuth server. And what's different now 
is that the, the response includes an access token and an ID token. So this access token is only meant to be used to call the API. The ID token is for the client. And the ID token tells who the user was. It could in include ad other information about the user, first name, last name, hair color, shoe size, and how they authenticated, what sort of credential, when they authenticated, if an SSO cookie was used and they actually logged in many, many weeks ago. You can now see this and start to make decisions in here. Should I call this API? Should I call that API? Should I show this tab? Should I sh not show that tab? You can't do those sort of things with just OAuth. And that's what everybody was trying to add on top of OAuth, and, and that's why you had all these various implementations um, that, that resulted in incompatibility and security issues. That access token, as I said, is for calling APIs. One of the APIs that you can call is a standard API called the user info endpoint. So if you call with that access token, the OpenID Connect provider can return additional user data. That user data, you could have a very compact ID token with just like a global identifier, and then you could return back more uh, identity data if you wanted to. So maybe like the first time you log in, you need to bootstrap or create a new user account. For that, you need additional data. But after that, you only need the user ID to you know find that, that stuff. Those are the sort of scenarios you can do with the user info endpoint. You can also do some very clever things like in that user info endpoint, return a bunch more tokens to call different APIs. I'll get into that a little bit. So the ID token is for the client. The access token, as I said, was for the API. And the refresh token, any guesses on who that's for? Neither of those. It's for the OAuth server. So the refresh token, remember, is like the password, and you use that to get a new session. Refresh token only presented to the OAuth server, ID token for the client. So you have sort of all four of these actors, and at least three of them are getting their own specific token, and you need to keep it straight. Because imagine if you sent your, your password to the wrong person. That password now is, I, is known. That's the, the danger of symmetric keys, and that's the danger uh, of uh, refresh tokens. That user info endpoint is a standard API that you can use, that you can count on from any op compliant OpenID provider to return at least certain biographical data, uh, like email, some basic profile data, uh, verified phone number, these sort of things are standardized claims. Uh, and then the, the subject or the global unique identifier of the user who authenticated. One thing I should back up here and say is that this flow that I just showed you was one of the flows in OpenID Connect. Remember in OAuth I said there were four. OpenID Connect is building more on top of this. And I'm just showing you here now the code flow where you're able to get the token uh, and the ID token, uh, the access token and the ID token as a response. But there are other ways to do it where you're actually sending the ID token in here and not doing any of this, this code flow stuff. So it can be pretty complicated, but there are reasons that these are there so that you can solve all these different scenarios. One of the scenarios I want to talk about is with building services. Um, you know, when you build services traditionally, you have all the different capabilities of that service. You know, you got the transaction and accounting and I don't know, whatever other uh, features of that service all bundled together and packaged together as this monolithic application. And you got those various components in there, and as you scaled it, you need to take and deploy it on a whole other server and, you know, scale it horizontally in that fashion, where you get a duplicate of every component within that service. And more and more, what people are doing is sort of dissecting or um, extracting out the different capabilities within those monolithic applications. Is anyone building microservices today? Don't over dissect, but break those down into those microservices where each of them is doing the one thing that it's doing and it's doing it really, really well. Now you can scale them as you need to. You can have more yellow ones, more green ones, however you need to have them so that each of those can scale to the requirements that they have. So this is good, but we have to solve security in this. We have to figure out who's calling these APIs, who's calling these microservices. 
So traditionally what you'll do is you'll have some sort of interceptor. doesn't matter what web application framework you're using, whether it's .NET or Java or Python or Go or whatever. There's some sort of interceptor layer in your web server that's going to check, are you authenticated? And to do that, it's going to check some sort of session store. Um, now, and, and that, that's fine, that's how you do it. Now you have these microservices, and they're all going to have to check. And they all have this shared dependency, and that's what we don't want with microservices, right? They should all be independent of each other and not sharing databases, not sharing uh, those different components. Otherwise, they're not really a microservice. So how do you solve the identity problem? How do you solve the API access problem? OAuth can help with this. Remember what we talked about with the uh, different types of tokens? So the, the by value token has all of the identity data in it, and the reference token has just a pointer to the data. So let's use those two to solve this microservices problem and to make the securing of those better. So we want to have the make sure that no information outside of the network uh, is in the token. So what we say is, uh, outside the network, once the token leaves your premises, switch it to a reference token. And on the inside of your network, switch to a value token. Okay? So then what's happening here is that you have a reference token coming into your network, and then you have some sort of API firewall, reverse proxy, something like this, that will switch it to a by value token. So you do the token translation in the API firewall. So we have two problems with the microservices where we need to identify the user and we need to create a session. To do that, we want to send the by value token into all those microservices because then they can validate the JOT token which has all of the identity data or some value uh, by value token, have all of the identity in it, and they won't have to uh, make that call to the database. They won't have to check anything because it will all be in the token. Make sense? But we want to do that translation. So the, the resource owner, the end user, will send that reference token in. The reverse proxy will switch it into uh, a by value token, and then each of these guys, all they have to do is have the, the public key of the one who signed this token to be able to validate it and use everything inside of it. So there's no call to the database, there's, there's nothing. It's just, I have this, it's valid, I can store the fact that it's valid for a while if I want to, uh, and then uh, consume that identity data. And then by also having the reference token on the outside of the network, you're protecting yourself a little bit by not passing that data around. Okay. So if reading is more your way to learning something or if it helps you learn also, uh, here are some blog posts. Snap a picture of that. Uh, there's also a white paper out here at the Tubo booth, which you can basically read everything I just said uh, in prose and in written words. Um, and also, if, if videos are more your thing, or you'd like to also catch a, a presentation of this, you can check those out there. Um, and also, we'll have an API security ebook coming out uh, in the next few weeks. So, quick summary API security is much more than API keys. So, API keys are uh, really just passwords, they're symmetric keys, and you'll probably use them here or there. Uh, but you need more than that. And OAuth is a great start. It's part of it. You need to have enterprise security, API security, um, and endpoint security. And to provide the API security, you need more than OAuth. You need the complete Neo security stack. You need to build on open standards that you're free to implement, free to buy products that support those protocols. Uh, and you need to make sure that you've got not only OAuth, but other things like OpenID Connect, Skim, JSON, uh, Identity Suite, and whatnot. So build on top of that. And when using uh, those to build microservices, you can use that switching of by reference and by value tokens. So I have a few minutes left in my talk. 
if there are questions, I'd be happy to take them. Otherwise, I'm going to get up out of their slide deck. Okay, I'm glad it was so clear.